can't we just all get along? Have tensions accelerated, or are we simply more aware of what's been happening all along because of the immediacy of our digital world? I personally find it very difficult not to despair about the discrimination and injustice I see everywhere I look. So we thought that tapping into deeper knowledge might help us understand. Our guests tonight will illuminate some of the dark corners of the human psyche and let us know, is there hope for humans to respect one another, embrace our differences, and get along at least better? But before we go plunge into that, for the sake of kind of creating some community, I'd like to ask each of you to turn to the person next to you, introduce yourself, and then tell them one reason why you wanted to come to the program tonight. And James, do you mind giving people a little light? And so now, with this fresh sense of connection, um, I'd like to turn the stage over to Dr. Timothy McCarthy, who will shepherd us through the evening. Um, please help me give Tim a very warm welcome. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight and for weathering the traffic, as it were, to get here. Uh, politics, prejudice, and polarization. When I first got the invitation to help to moderate this evening's conversation and discussion, I thought that this was a really elegant, alliterative characterization of the United States and its history. And I'm a historian, and so I tend to take the long view of things, even though I too, like Lisa, get caught up in the moment, our 24-hour, seven days a week news cycle, the kind of frenzy of social media, the election season that we're in. Uh, but I try as best I can to sort of bring myself out, if not others, out into a longer view to try to give us some perspective. I'm try to offer a little bit of that in my opening remarks uh, tonight. Along with politics, prejudice, and polarization, there comes a question. Can we cross the divide? And so tonight, we're going to be examining each of those three pieces, politics, prejudice, polarization, and their interconnection. But we're also going to be debating and discussing, contemplating, and imagining how we might answer that important question. Can we cross the divide? And a related question, if so, how? I wanted to start by reading a, a recent uh, Pew finding, Pew study on partisanship and political animosity. And it's a striking study with a whole range of findings that are relevant to tonight's conversation. But just let me read you from the beginning of that study. Partisans' views of the opposing party, Democrats and Republicans, are now more negative than at any point in nearly a quarter of a century. For the first time in surveys dating back to 1992, which was the first time I voted in a presidential campaign, uh, majorities in both parties express not just unfavorable, but very unfavorable views of the other party. And today, sizable shares of both Democrats and Republicans say that the other party stirs feelings of not just frustration, but of fear and anger. More than half of Democrats, 55%, say that the Republican Party makes them afraid, while 49% of Republicans say the same about the Democratic Party. Among, the highly, among those highly engaged in politics, those most engaged, people who commit their time and treasure to campaigns themselves, fully 70% of Democrats and 62% of Republicans say they are afraid of the other party. So people who are more engaged are more afraid of the opposition. Across a number of realms, negative feelings about the opposing party are as powerful, and in many cases more powerful, as the positive feelings they have for their own parties. So they hate the opposition more than they like themselves. Democrats give Republicans a mean rating of just 31 on a thermometer rating scale from zero to 100. Republicans give Democrats a mean rating of 29. The temperature ratings of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are even lower. The average rating for Trump among Democrats is 11 
on a zero to 100 thermometer scale, and Clinton gets an average rating of 12 among Republicans. Barack Obama gets a zero from 59% of Republicans. Michelle Obama gets a zero out of 100 from 40% of Republicans. So yeah, we're polarized. And the way that these three Ps interact and collide in this particular vortex that we're experiencing at the moment is we have an election season at a fever pitch. And I don't know whether or not you can get a fever pitch or hear a fever pitch or feel a fever pitch from the sewer that we seem to be residing in. We also, because of this election season, but not just because of this election season, see that prejudice has been unleashed in new and vocal and vicious ways. Prejudice has certainly not been invented by this moment in American history and certainly not by the age of Obama or the presidency of Obama as Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York, would like to have us believe. But prejudice in so many forms seems to be taking on a particularly vicious and even violent manifestation at this moment. And so prejudice too, just like politics, is at a fever pitch. And then of course polarization and antipathy for the opposing sides, opposing point of view, opposing people, uh, seems to be at an all-time high. And so all three of these things, politics, prejudice, polarization, are all operating at a very intense and accelerated level. And so here we are. But as I said, I'm a historian, and so I like to take the longer view of American history and to say that as bad as things are, as divided as we may be in this moment, we have been here before. This is nothing new in the world in America. I had been teaching a course this term called American Protest Literature from Tom Paine to Tupac, its own alliterative <laughs> elegance. And we've, we're about halfway through the course, and we started the course with the Declaration of Independence, that unanimous Declaration of Independence by the 13 colonies, only that unanimity itself was a fiction. There was enormous debate, rancor, antipathy, opposition, violence, resistance in the colonies at the very moment that they were debating that and at the moment they were circulating that declaration. If you had taken a public opinion poll, we didn't have them at the time, in January of 1776, the country would have been evenly divided, deeply polarized over the very issue of independence that six months later they came together to declare. The election of 1800 was so nasty that John Adams left town rather than shake hands or appear on stage with Thomas Jefferson. Four years before, when John Wa George Washington left office, instead of deliver his farewell address, he wrote it, sent it to the newspapers to publish it because he was so disgusted by the partisanship of the emerging political parties that he couldn't stand to be there anymore. And that's the founding father, George Washington. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, these are people we revere so often in our history books, and they were fully part of the same kind of rancor, and antipathy, and partisan opposition that we see today. We spent a lot of time in this course talking about slavery and abolitionist writings. In 1836, Congress passed a gag rule because there were so many anti-slavery petitions flooding into Congress from the North that they didn't even want to have debates about slavery anymore because they had been so nasty so polarizing that they were threatening to divide the nation. And of course, we know that those debates over slavery and abolition did ultimately divide the nation, increasingly so. Things got nastier and more bitter over the entire antebellum period from the 1830s through the Civil War. So that when 1850 comes, you have the Compromise of 1850. The regional divides between the North and the South are the worst they'd ever been. Violence on the uptick, radicalism everywhere, resistance and reaction the rule of the day. In 1856, Charles Sumner, the senator from Massachusetts, was caned nearly to death by Preston Brooks, a senator from South Carolina, who came down the aisle after he had given an abolitionist speech and knocked him in the head with his cane, put him in the hospital, put him out of commission. Ain't nobody gonna do that to Elizabeth Warren today. <laughs> Four years later, Lincoln gets elected. The entire South secedes, plunging the nation into a bloody civil war that took 700 thousand American lives and freed four million other Americans who had been enslaved and denied full citizenship. Just this week, I taught Ida B. Wells' anti-lynching writings. 
Southern Horrors and Red Record, which she published in 1892 and 1895, when she was a voice in the wilderness against the white supremacist vigilante violence of the 19th century that came with the ascendancy of white redemption of the South after the promise of biracial democracy and reconstruction. 4,000 plus black lives that did not matter at the time perished at the hands of bloody mobs of Southern gentlemen of property and standing. So we've been here before. You can't tell a historian that this is the worst it's ever been when they have read the constitutional debates and the pamphlet wars and the anti-slavery writings and the pro-slavery pamphlets and the protest literature of the nation and the anti-lynching writings and the advertisements of lynchings in Southern newspapers and tell me that Trump is the worst thing that's ever happened to America. We've been having debates about whether black lives matter since the birth of the nation itself. And so when we think about politics and prejudice and polarization, I like to think about the politics of prejudice and polarization as occurring and taking place in three locations, one being identity, the way in which society marks us in various ways, race, gender, sexuality, nationality, et cetera, the way we identify ourselves to others in groups and as individuals. Identity is a location of the politics of prejudice and polarization. Another location is ideology, the kind of worldview that we develop, the political partisanship that we practice, the affiliations that we give to parties and so forth, the way that we interpret the world based on perhaps our material conditions, which leads me to a third location of the politics of prejudice and polarization, which is inequality, the systemic inequities that exist with respect to privilege and power and resources, access to them, opportunities to have them, material conditions. And so identity and ideology and inequality are often locations not distinct from one another, often overlapping and intersecting, colliding, creating conflict where the politics of prejudice and polarization are often rooted and where they stem from. And so tonight we have an opportunity, a great opportunity to be here with four of my distinguished friends and colleagues, a political scientist, a sociologist, two psychologists. It's not the beginning of a joke. I guarantee it'll be a very serious and substantive conversation, even with an Irishman presiding over the moderation. Irish people, in my opinion, don't really have the capacity for moderation. I certainly don't. Uh, but I'm going to try my best today. Uh, I know that was a you know ethnic humor joke in a polar, polarization, prejudice, and politics uh, session. I, I can do that because I'm talking about myself. Um, but we have four distinguished scholars who are going to help us work through these categories and locations and their interaction and their collision, and then to be in conversation with themselves and then with all of us here in the theater today uh, in the after uh, part of the program. So without further delay, I'm going to invite my first colleague, Mina Chikara from Harvard University to come up and give her presentation and then we'll move in order through our distinguished guests. Thanks for coming. Well, first I want to start by thanking the Museum of Science and the event organizers for having us. This is an incredible event and it's an honor for me to be a part of it. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight to share this with us and I'm sure we're going to have an amazing conversation together. And of course, I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists as well as our moderator, uh, especially for that inspiring introduction, your tough act to follow. So to give you a little bit of background, my research is all about how prejudice and group membership change the way that we interact with each other. Psychologists for a very long time and more recently neuroscientists studied the thoughts, feelings, and brain processes that allow us to see one another as human, to infer the contents of one another's minds, to empathize with each other, cooperate, and more generally behave pro-socially. And we know that the mind and brain are capable of these incredible feats of computation that allow us to navigate really complex interactions. But what I'm interested in is when people fail to engage these computations. Specifically, I study how processes like empathy and communication break down when social relations shift from me and you to us and them. So when we move from interacting as two people, two agents, to interacting as representative of our respective groups. 
And I'm equally interested in the behavioral consequences of this, including conflict, discrimination, and aggression. But before we get to all of that, uh, I'd like to share a story with you. So a few years ago, my husband took me to a Red Sox-Yankees game at Yankee Stadium. Do I have any Red Sox fans in the audience? I knew I could count on you. Excellent. So my husband's a Red Sox fan. Uh, so he was wearing his Sox cap. I'm not really a fan of either team. I'm sorry, Red Sox fans. But I really enjoy the psychology and spectacle of sporting events. So before the game and during the first few innings, several Yankees fans commented on my husband's hat. That's my husband there. Uh, they made good-natured jokes about the way that the game would go, and he heckled them back. It was all in good fun. But as the innings wore on and the scores remained close, I noticed the interactions between my husband and these Yankees fans getting a little bit more hostile. I noticed my husband's patience wearing thin. And so I simply took the hat from him. I didn't have any place to stash it, so I put it on. And naively, I assumed that nothing would happen because as I just told you, I'm not really a fan of either team. I wasn't going to look to start any trouble, and I was sure that they would somehow figure out that I wasn't, and so they would just leave me alone. But of course, I was completely wrong. So uh, I won't repeat any of the particular things that some of these Yankees fans said to me, but it was only a matter of about 10 minutes before I was screaming at this Yankees fan, and my husband had to place himself physically between me and this Yankees fan so that I wouldn't take a swing at him. And I'm generally a very docile person, I assure you. So what is it about this situation that made me behave this way? Well, I want to talk about the sort of fundamental building blocks of group conflict a fundamental component of human nature, the tendency to draw bright boundaries between us and them. So the good news is, is that these responses are flexible. We are not hapless victims of our environments or our evolution. And the more we're aware of the factors that make us likely to harm and attack people from other groups, perhaps the more likely we'll be able to control those factors. But before we get there, we need to understand what makes people or me at Yankee Stadium behave this way. Simply acting as a group member changes how people behave. In other words, people's thoughts, feelings, and their behaviors towards other people completely change when the context shifts from just me and you to us and them. Just that lens of thinking about it as an intergroup interaction changes people's expectations. So if we look back in our evolutionary history, our ancestors reaped numerous material and psychological benefits by being able to identify and cooperate with fellow in-group members. These benefits included protection, pooled resources, a satisfaction of the psychological need to belong to something greater than just ourselves, and those people who could identify and cooperate with their fellow group members reaped more benefits. The flip side of this tendency to draw bright boundaries between us and them is that group life also has significant costs. So group living produces pressure to conform, sometimes making us do and say things that we wouldn't do and say if we were by ourselves. And it's also, of course, uh, associated with intractable conflict between groups. But of course, that was our ancestors. Where did these tendencies come from nowadays? Well, groups continue to change how people behave because they change people's expectations of what's appropriate in a given social interaction. It's almost like people have a different template, a more aggressive template for group on group as opposed to one-on-one -on -one interactions. Remember, I walked into Yankee Stadium and I, wasn't, and, I, and I walked in completely different. But the second I started wearing the cap, I marked my group membership to outsiders. Right? They didn't know the contents of my mind. And so despite the fact that I didn't have any beef with Yankees fans, they created it in me because they treated me like I was a member of Red Sox Nation. Because they did that, I then took on the Red Sox identity. And what was interesting about that is that I took on that identity because I was no longer being treated as an individual, I was being treated as a member of Red Sox Nation. So decades of psychological research reveal that I'm not unique in this regard. For example, people remember interactions between groups as being more aggressive than one-on-one -on -one interactions. For example, if you ask people to keep a daily diary of all of their interactions over the course of several days, and then you ask them to remark on how those interactions went, say, a business meeting, people reliably report that their group-on-group -group interactions were more abrasive than their one-on-one -on -one interactions. People also rate ongoing group-on-group -on -group interactions as more competitive and less cooperative than one-on-one -on -one interactions, even when groups are not actually in competition. Finally, people expect group-on-group -group interactions that have yet to take place to be more aggressive than one-on-one -on -one interactions. And of course, these findings probably dovetail with your own past experiences, right? I mean, ever since you were yay big, 
you know, the teacher would split you out your, te your classroom into two teams, and it was mostly because the two teams were in competition, right? So it's not surprising then that people develop this template and then apply it in their lives as they grow older. So do these memories and expectations actually change how people behave? Absolutely. People behave more aggressively in intergroup as compared to one-on-one -on -one interactions. So compare a situation in which you bring either two individuals or two groups of three people together into the lab, and you tell them that they either as individuals are going to have to decide how to treat one another. Across dozens of studies, researchers find that people cheat more when they play games as teams as compared to alone. This even extends to situations in which people are asked to physically harm one another. For example, participants in the lab will assign the other side to drink more painfully hot hot sauce when they make the decision as a team as compared to when they play alone. So what is it about groups that foments this kind of aggressive behavior? Why do groups change how people behave? Well, there's at least three factors that contribute to increased aggression between groups, so I should note that this is not an exhaustive list. First of all, Groups allow us to reframe our actions as being necessary for achieving our own group's goals. Said another way, sometimes we think that being a good group member means being a jerk to the other side. Second, groups allow for the displacement or the diffusion of responsibility for negative outcomes. So when we, uh, when, when we act as members of a group, we feel less personally responsible for bad outcomes because it gives us a little bit more latitude to do things that we wouldn't do on, by ourselves. Third, groups may change our emotional responses to others' plights. Where we would normally be moved to help people who are suffering, groups sometimes eliminate that impulse or even flip it. And this last possibility is the one that I've been really interested in and have spent several years studying now. So how do you feel when you witness or learn of another person's misfortune? Well, one very common response is that you empathize with them. You feel some version of what they're feeling, or you at least feel bad for them. And we know that this is an extremely important response because it promotes helping behavior. But of course, it's not the case that you empathize with all people all the time, nor would it necessarily make sense if you did. So an alternative is that we feel nothing. And more and more evidence indicates that these sorts of lapses of empathy, something that Alan's also going to be talking about, are particularly likely when targets are socially distant, so when they belong to different ethnic or cultural groups. That said, the absence of empathy is not antipathy, it's more like apathy. And we generally don't think of apathy as a potent predictor of behavior unless we're talking about neglect. So more than the absence of empathy, what I've been really interested in is the conditions under which we feel the exact opposite of what the person who's suffering is feeling. <laughs> this is something the Germans call schadenfreude, when you take pleasure in response to other people's misfortune. And I will use the term counter-empathic responses for shorthand. So I'm interested in these counter-empathic responses specifically because I think that they are potent predictors of intergroup aggression, certainly more potent than uh, apathy is. So what predicts which of these three reactions we have when we see somebody suffering? Well, I'm going to argue that groups that are perceived as threatening to our well-being are going to be the ones that are most likely to be targeted with the absence of empathy, but also these counter-empathic responses. So we've tested this in explicit cases of competition, and this is where we wanted to start because we wanted to start in a domain where people would be willing to admit of emotions like schadenfreude. So, I'm going to be calling on all of my Yank uh, Red Sox fans in the room. I want you to watch this baseball play. What we have is Johnny Damon playing for the Yankees, and he is batting, but the Orioles are pitching to him. He gets the ball, he hits it, oh, and he gets tagged out at first. How do you feel? Yeah, it's good, right? And what's interesting about this is that, so, so Red Sox fans often feel, they report feeling pleasure. And What's interesting is that we know that this is driven by the long-standing rivalry between these two teams. Despite the fact that your own team isn't playing and there's no material benefit to your team when the score is 0-0 and one player gets tagged at it first. Furthermore, the stimulus only takes on a positive value by virtue of the fact that you identify as a Red Sox fan. If you didn't care about baseball, none of this would mean anything to you. So one of the things we were interested in understanding was whether this kind of value would rely on the same brain circuits that generally track non-social forms of value. So money, sex, compliments, and so on. So we scanned 18 hardcore Red Sox and Yankees fans watching plays like the one you just saw, and we put them in an fMRI scanner. And as predicted, watching your team score 
but also watching your, fa your rival fail against you and fail against the Orioles, it engaged many different regions across the brain. But the only one that was correlated with how much pleasure people said they felt was this region I've circled here, which is called the ventral putamen. And it's part of a larger structure that's a ventral, called the ventral striatum. So those people who said that it felt that much better to watch their rival fail exhibited that much more activation in this brain region. Now you may be wondering, what on earth does this region do otherwise? Well, this region is associated with reward-based learning. That is, it responds to surprising rewards in the service of changing our behaviors to make getting the rewards again more likely. So this is the basic building block of how we learn. But more important for our purposes this evening, what we found was that those fans who later told us they were more likely to heckle, insult, threaten, and hit rival fans were the same ones who exhibited that much more activation in this region when they watched their rival fail. So one possibility is that if watching your rival fail or experience misfortune is consistently accompanied by the experience of pleasure, that pleasure may be teaching you over time that it's OK to harm your enemies and affiliated individuals, thus thereby lowering that bar that typically keeps us from harming other people. Now, we find that the effect of competition and status emerge in much more subtle contexts. So how would you feel if you saw this gentleman accidentally walk into a glass door? Aw, right? Yeah, are you okay? What about this guy? <laughs> you guys are great participants. I love replicating that effect. So what's interesting about this situation is that there's no explicit competition between you and either of these targets, but the stereotypes associated with the guy on the right include attributions of competitiveness and threat. And it turns out that's enough to modulate people's empathic responses. So I find that people actually smile more, as measured by something called facial electromyography, where we put electrodes on the cheek muscles to measure how much they're activated when they draw your lips into a smile. I find that people smile more when bad things happen to the guy, people like the guy on the right relative to people like the guy on the left. We find that people are also more willing to subject that kind of guy to harm, and that this is true across a wide variety of exemplars. It seems to be best predicted by attributions of competitive threat and status rather than any of the other dimensions along which these two differ, say age or similarity to yourself. Now, one of the amazing things about humans is how quickly they form groups and how quickly those groups inform their attitudes, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors like this gentleman here. And what we know is that you don't need much to generate tension between groups of people. So classic social psychological experiments show that even random assignment to groups, team A, team B, leads to greater resource allocation to your own group, even when you knew everybody walking into the room prior to being assigned to a team. So we wanted to see whether or not we could replicate our empathy gap results with even these minimal kinds of groups, right? So teams to which people have just been assigned, so no stereotypes, no history of rivalry, no, no existing animus, and we just showed people stories like, you know, this person is on team A, they found a sentimental possession that meant a lot to them, how good do you feel, how bad do you feel, or if this person is on team B and they got soaked by a cab driving through a puddle. And they, all these stories would be associated with people either on their own team or on the other team. And what we found was that as long as we told people that the teams were going to compete in the future, people reported greater empathy for their own team than the other team, but they also reported greater counter-empathy for the other team than their own team. And so what we find that's even more interesting is that if you tell people that these teams are actually in the future going to work together, the effect goes away completely. Cooperation. So sometimes I get the feedback that teams, games, online competition, all these things sort of license people to self-report dampened empathy and counter-empathic responses. And of course, this would never happen if we used real social groups and cultural groups. But of course, we also know that this isn't the case. So this is an article from just a couple months ago this summer after the bombing in Bangladesh. And the question that this article is asking is where are the Facebook filters? Where are the text-based donation campaigns? In another series of experiments, we presented American participants with the same kinds of stories I just told you about happening to either people who had American or Arab names. What we found is that participants not only reported greater empathy for Americans than Arabs, they also reported greater counter-empathy for Arabs and Americans. More importantly, we found, it, we found that the extent to which they reported counter-empathy for Arabs predicted how little they were willing to do, specifically complete puzzles, that would then translate into us making donations to the Syrian Arab Red Crescent. So understanding the role of empathy in intergroup context is obviously very important, but I hope I've convinced you that in cases where groups are already 
hostile toward one another, it may be less critical, at least initially, to foster harmony and empathy, and more important to down-regulate down feelings of hostility and concomitant emotions like feeling pleasure in response to other people's misfortunes. And one last caveat I want to leave you with is that promoting empathy and harmony is not sufficient to affect concrete social change, particularly when groups are of an equal status. So I'd just like to share one last study with you. In one, in one experiment spearheaded by a colleague of mine, Tamar, Tamar Saggy, and her colleagues, participants were either assigned to a low power or a high power group. And they were assigned that way because the high power group could decide how to allocate resources that were given to them between the high power and the low power group by the experimenters. And then the two groups were set to the task of either discussing their differences or discussing what they had in common. And what we found, or what they found, was that commonality focused as compared to different focused contact between the groups actually created higher expectations for equitable resource allocation between the groups. So talking about what you have in common makes the low power group expect the high power group to be fair. The problem is the high power group's behavior doesn't change between the commonality and the difference-focused discussion. So in other words, getting groups to just get along or to take each other's perspectives can actually backfire because it leads to high power groups allowing to remain comfortable with the status quo, and it makes the low power groups feel less entitled to air their grievances because they don't want to rock the boat now that we're all getting along. And it also sets up a situation for greater betrayal among low power groups because they now have the expectation of receiving equitable treatment, but the high, high power groups aren't uh, actually engaging in it. So I'll stop with that teaser because my time is up, and more importantly, I'm sure we'll continue this conversation in this vein after the presentations. So I'd just like to thank you again for your time and attention. So I'm a New Yorker and a Yankees fan. Now I know why you asked me to moderate, but I, I want, just want to say, Mina, thank you for that a remarkable uh, presentation. I was feeling enormous empathy and pleasure during the entire, uh, during the entire uh, thing. I remember that play when Donnie and Damon got, uh, got called out. Now I'd like to uh, invite up to the podium our next uh, distinguished guest, uh, uh, Alan Lambert, who will continue in some ways the conversation that we were just having about empathy, its limits and possibilities, and also uh, bring that into the realm of talking more explicitly about bias, implicit bias and otherwise. Alan? Great. Thank you very much. And um, let me also um, give my appreciation to the Museum of Science to um, bring us out here. I'm very excited to talk about um, some aspects of prejudice and stereotyping. Um, so. When I give talks like this, I like to start off with a just pointing out something that may be somewhat obvious. When we talk about prejudice and stereotyping, um, everybody agrees um, that, that these are bad. It, you, it's hard to find somebody who says, yes, I'm prejudiced, and I really like that. Um, so we all agree that these are bad things. But the question is, why do these still exist if we all agree that these are things are bad and that shouldn't be there? Um, I'm going to give you some insights in this. It's not the, an exhaustive consideration of all the reasons, but I'm going to start off with um, a classic approach. Um, I didn't invent this. This was um, certainly positioned and, and advocated, perhaps most famously, by um, Gordon Allport in his famous 1954 book. Um, human beings love to categorize, and we're not the only species that does this, but since we're all humans, let's talk about us, I guess. Uh, and this has a strong evolutionary uh, foundation um, categorization, uh, and by categorization, I simply mean sorting the world into functionally useful categories and concepts, X's and Y's, or A's and B's. And just to start out with a simple example, um, it's useful to sort the world into two categories, dangerous things and non-dangerous things, things that can eat us and things that are, are relatively benign. I do want to mention, of course, that this is not a perfect categorization system. For one thing, it's not always immediately clear what's dangerous and what's not. And here we get into some nuances about threshold. Do you, is it better to guess that something's dangerous than, than not? So, but in any event, it's useful to divide the world into dangerous and non-dangerous things. Cliffs could be dangerous. Um, sharks could be dangerous, and um, puppies and, and bunny rabbits and kittens, probably not dangerous. 
Same thing for food. Um, it's useful to sort things into food and non-food. Uh, and I use this example of uh, red berries, right? So famously, these could be food, they could be edible, could be poisonous. And in this case, it's usually to best to assume that it's um, not food, not something to put in your mouth um, and be on the safe side. So in any event, um, these are some uh, classic examples that lead us up to my next point, which is we also engage in this categorization for social things. And I want to do a little um, uh, demonstration, um, a little audience participation. Um, so I'd like you to take a look at the slides to follow and simply try to remember all the faces that appear in the screen. All right, so that's your job, is just to remember all the faces. Ready? Okay, go. Okay, time's up. So, um, now, you may have recognized a couple of famous faces in there, um, but in general, if we had been doing a controlled experiment, uh, in general, people notice at least two things, at least two. One is ethnicity, or if you wanted to get down to it, skin color, skin tone, and gender, and perhaps age as well. Um, the important part of my talk is that even if you're trying not to pay attention to race, um, you will, and in fact, there's lots of studies suggesting if I tell you in advance, don't pay attention to race, in fact, they'll make it even worse. Um, and there's some reasons for that we can talk about later. Okay, so that's the one foundation. Of we tend to divide the world into categories. It's not a perfect system, um, and indeed, sometimes it's, it's maladaptive, but uh, it can be maladaptive, but in general, it's something that's, I wouldn't say hardwired, but it, it's really a part of our makeup. Okay, now, you may have noticed that simply dividing the world into categories in itself doesn't, uh, it's a necessary condition for um, prejudice, but it's not a sufficient one. There's a next step, which is saying that my category is better than yours. My tribe is better than yours. Um, and here we're on to the classic um, finding, perhaps of all the, um, if you held a gun to my head and said, what's the most robust effect in social science? It's probably in-group favoritism. Um, people have a strong motivation to believe that the groups that they belong to are superior, superior to or more likable than other groups. Um, and this objective, unfortunately, is easily met by derogating other groups. So that's a neat trick. A neat trick. So if I belong to group X and I think all Ys are despicable, Xs look pretty good by comparison. Um, so actually, from a, from a um, theoretical standpoint, there's at least two theories as to why this occurs. One is based on a classic uh, piece of work by Henry Tajfeld, the Belgian psychologist, and basically the punchline is people who belong to, to valued groups, it enhances self-esteem. If I belong to a really groovy, great group, that enhances my self-esteem. Um, um, higher than otherwise would be. Another approach is more, which is more sociologically based is, has to do with power. If I belong to a particular group, I want my group to have power, often at the expense of other group members. So there's that self-esteem as well as power afforded by belonging to a powerful group, and those two things in combination can lead to in-group favoritism. Okay. So that's the first part of my talk. Um, another one, what I'm going to talk a little bit is about um, uh, a question that's been of interest to social scientists for quite some time, and the question is, is stereotyping and prejudice really fading in the United States? Now, in some sense, if you look at the data, um, this is just one piece of data, there could be some reason for optimism. So this is um, a famous set of data looking at 50 years of changing perceptions by Princeton undergraduates. So they basically took undergraduates at Princeton as well as at Colgate University, which is equivalent demographically, and they basically asked them, um, to, these are all white participants, to think about the attributes that they would associate with um, African Americans. And so the percentage that I'm giving here would represent, um, so they in essence ask undergraduates, um, what percentage you, of you would attribute the trait superstitious to African Americans, they might have said Negroes at that point, um, it was 84%. So, um, so that looks pretty stereotypic. These are basically saying that African Americans are superstitious, lazy, ignorant, and musical. It's 1933. No surprise there. And if you fast forward, then we have 1951. Things seem to be looking a little better. Um, at least super uh, lazy from 75% down to 31. 1969. 
Um, things are looking better, although the musical pops up um, higher. In 1982, this is Colgate University, near where I grew up, um, demographically similar to Princeton. And, you know, although not great, the numbers look relatively better. Um, so that is to say, focusing on lazy, we've gone down from 75%, 31, 26, 13. So in some sense, you could say, hmm, this is cause for some optimism. Um, prejudice seems to be getting less prevalent. Um, but, you know, people in my, my graduate students call my lab the doom and gloom lab, lab and unfortunately there's a pessimistic uh, approach or way of looking at this. And these are two major challenges to prejudice and stereotyping, uh, research on stereotyping and prejudice. The data that I just showed you is what we call um, um, an explicit um, attitude. We're asking people directly, do you associate this trait with this particular group? Um, and um, so there's two problems here. Um, one is, uh, well, here, the question is you're trying to get people to be truthful, uh, but you can't always depend on that. So beginning with the first one, the motivational problems, people have a strong motive to present themselves to others as unfair, unbi uh, fair, unbiased, and free of prejudice. No one walks around saying, gosh, I'm really biased and unfair. No, everyone likes to think that they have an um, objectively accurate view of the world. Um, so it's unlikely that people will openly disclose their stereotypes and prejudices if you ask them directly. So if you ask a person in a poll, say, are you in favor of equal rights for African Americans? Um, now there's some exceptions to that, but most people say, yes, I like African Americans. Um, again, some uh, exceptions, but by and large, people have a pressure to say positive things. And secondly, and this is another problem with explicit measures, and again, by explicit, I just mean you ask people openly, what are your feelings about gays? What are your feelings about liberals? What are your feelings about African Americans? The other problem is awareness. People may not even be aware of their own stereotypic biases and, and attitudes. Um, so even if people are trying to be pr truthful, may, they may not know it. Okay. So the question is, what do you do? The general feeling among people in my field and other fields is that explicit traditional questionnaires can be very useful, but when you get to really sensitive issues, for example, about race, these explicit traditional questionnaires may be of limited usefulness. So the question is, what do you do? Are there other ways to study stereotyping and prejudice, um, say, in the realm of race or other areas? Um, and this is a uh, large area of, of research, as they say, it's a hot topic. And this is research and theory on uh, implicit attitudes. Um, and just, I don't have time to talk a lot about this, but we can ask some questions about, um, for example, what are they, how do you measure these, and, and, and why are they useful? This is a gross oversimplification, um, but here's the basic idea. If we were measuring implicit attitudes in you, we would sit you in front of a computer, and we would tell you something like this. We would say, we're going to flash some pictures at you. They're going to be faces. Um, ignore the faces. You're going to see them, but don't pay attention to them because they're going to go really quickly. After, and this is again, this is what I'd be telling you as a, as a participant, you're going to see a word flash on the screen, and all we would like you to do is tell us whether it's a good word or a bad word. And we'd say, see, there's a key mark good. Put your finger on that, and then there's a key mark bad. And that's all they're told to do. Respond as quickly as they can and tell us whether it's a good or a bad word. And that arrow means these are sequential or these occur over time. So we'd be first flashed a picture of, a, of an African American, and then the word honest occurs. And you're measuring how fast they can respond to the words. So you might have guessed by now there's a very robust finding is that people tend to respond more quickly to negative words if they're primed or presented with an African American face than if they're primed with a white face. Um, and conversely, if they're presented with a positive word like peaceful, you get a white face, goes goes away, and people are fairly quick to respond to peaceful with a good response um, compared to if they're prime with um, uh, an African-American face. Um, most whites, on average, show this effect. If I did this test, um, much to my chagrin, I'm sure I would show this effect to some extent. Interestingly enough, African-American participants will show this effect, although not as much. Um, there's also individual differences in this, but um, I mentioned this. This is a classic or a prototypical example of an implicit measure, and I'd be happy to take questions about this afterwards. These types of measures don't correlate all that strongly with explicit measures, and there's some reasons for that. Um, but I mentioned this. This is one way to get at the um, problem of people not being able to disclose or admit that they have these biases. Okay. Um, 
I want to talk in the uh, third part of my talk about what are the triggers for stereotyping and prejudice. In other words, this is a classic social psychological, sociological issue is that people will wax and wane in terms of how prejudiced or how stereotypic they are manifesting these behaviors. Um, there's many factors, um, but I'm going to talk about two. One is threat. Now, I'm, I'm giving an example of a terrorist threat, but threat comes in all shapes and sizes. It could be threat that um, could be threat, perceived threat of a terrorist attack. Could be a feeling that um, your group is losing power in the United States. It could be a sense that your superiority or your or, um, amount of power that you have is being threatened. It could be um, a variety of different um, um, sources of that threat. Um, this is an oversimplification, um, but threats to the in group can produce emotion. No surprise it's, that it's negative. Um, there's a lot of work now being done that's suggesting that anger and fear, they are correlated, but they are different. Interestingly enough, anger has some um, similarities with positive emotions. Most negative emotions are uh, retreat emotions. Anger actually is, is an approach emotion. When people are angry, they're confident. Uh, they tend to be risk takers. Um, when people are fearful, they t it's a retreat emotion, they tend to be risk averse. In any event, there's lots of research showing that, this, that these two pathways, anger and fear, can contribute to prejudice and discrimination, although in different ways. To connect with political ideology, and my colleague John will be talking perhaps a little bit about this, when people are threatened with terrorism, um, it's not changing their underlying ideological makeup, but it does make them more quote unquote conservative in some ways, and in particular it makes them more hawkish. Um, especially, well, I should say the, most of the research that I've been doing is that you, you can actually prime the, the threat of terrorism by having people look at films of the 9-11 attacks or write autobiographical stories. And compared to control groups, it makes people more hawkish, more in favor of a mandatory draft, more in favor of when Iraq and the Af Afghanistan was um, going on. Um, in favor of that. That explains in part why George Bush's approval rating went up about 40, 45 points in a matter of a couple days after the 9-11 attacks. So my main point here is that perceived threats to the in-group can do a lot of shifting, make people more prejudiced, and not only against the group that is perceived to be the source of the threat. It's not just, say, against Arab or Arab Americans. It can actually spread out and bleed over into other groups. Um, um, Mina mentioned uh, briefly um, empathy, and I usually get some disbelieving stares when I say this, um, and I'm gonna try to convince you that empathy can actually be the cause um, of prejudice and discrimination. I, I mentioned that I was sort of the doom and gloom guy. Um, this goes radically against uh, intuition. So to begin with our current president, um, there's a lot of talk in this country about the federal deficit, but I think we should talk more about their empathy deficit, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes to see the world through those who are different from us. So we've actually done studies on this. We asked people about if you're empathic, would that tend to help or hinder intergroup relations? And no surprise, people say, if we could just be more empathic, it would be better because we could put ourselves in the shoes of others. Well, um, as a metaphor, I like to use this example. There are some shoes you would rather not place yourselves into. Um, some shoes seem averse. If you ask people, oh, place yourselves in the shoes of others. And there's a classic study, um, forgetting um, the authors on this, um, the US Palestinians to put themselves in the shoes of um, the Israelis, they dislike them more, um, and vice versa. So when you ask people to empathize with the outgroup, especially if it's a strongly dislike outgroup, it produces boomerang effects. So the quasi-evolutionary approach to this is that we are, I will not say programmed, but we are tribal creatures. We like to empathize with the in-group, not so much with the out-group. Um, so Paul Bloom has just come out with a book that's called Against Empathy. Um, so a great example is that liberals argue for gun control, for example, by focusing on the victims of gun violence. Conservatives point to the unarmed victims of crime, defenseless against the savagery of others. I like that quote because as he says, uh, don't suppose that if the ideological opponents could only ramp up their empathy, they would think just like you. Um, this is what's often called the parochial empathy framework, that people are choosy in, they, in terms of who they choose to be empathic, uh, um, empathic towards. Um, some, a lot of work that we've been doing now, for example, in the Ferguson shooting between Michael Brown, or the shooting of Michael Brown by Darren Wilson, um, is a simplification of our paradigm. We, we use large surveys of reasonably representative of the United States, uh, adults, 
and we find no surprise, at least for us, for white participants. Liberals tend to side um, with Michael Brown. There's some historical psychological reasons for that. And conservatives tend to side with Darren Wilson. So things being equal, you tend to get that ideological split. Guess what? If you look at those conservatives who are particularly empathic dispositionally and the liberals are empathic, it makes it worse. Uh, empathic liberals really support Michael Brown, and empathic conservatives tend to really support Darren Wilson. So each group, um, they're both being empathic, but they're being empathic about different things. Um, we've replicated this with um, AIDS victims. Um, we find that on average, liberals tend to be more empathic towards, empathic liberals tend to be more supportive of AIDS victims, victims of AIDS compared to non-empathic liberals. Empathic conservatives tend to be more disparaging of AIDS victims compared to uh, non-empathic conservatives. So what empathy does, it makes, at least in some contexts, the ideological divide worse or more polarized. We are finding, um, there is some hope, we're actually finding that um, for depending on how you frame the issue, empathy can actually bring the groups together, but we're actually finding the more robust effect is the uh, polarization. And we're actually now just excited about a couple uh, pieces of data coming in the last couple of weeks. It seems to be about emotion. Empathic people tend to be more emotive. They tend to respond more uh, strongly with their affect. And whatever feelings that they're having tend to be intensified if they're empathic. So that's why I could explain why liberals and conservatives are even more polarized. Um, it seems to have to do with the intensity of their emotional reaction. OK, um, just a couple more slides. Um, but it's, I don't think it's all doom and gloom, although everything I've said has been pretty gloomy. Um, I think there is room for optimism. Um, the metaphor I like to use is aggression. Um, there's lots of reasons, biological, genetic, evolutionary reasons why human beings, especially men, are aggressive. Um, I could, if there's anything that's, that's hardwired in human beings, it would be aggression as evolutionary advantage. But that doesn't mean that human beings these days go around being, go around being indiscriminately aggressive. We can suppress or inhibit our aggressive impulses um, and get along with other people. So it's not a biological inevitability. We can suppress, inhibit, use our large frontal cortex to um, suppress these urges. And I think although the peril is not perfect, um, I think that um, although there's reasons why we are stereotypic and prejudiced, I think we can think ahead and suppress those impulses. Um, and I think if we can um, give people, as political scientists like to say, the sober second thought, and they can um, think about how they're going to respond, I think there is room for optimism along those lines. Um, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate those fascinating remarks. Next up, we will have uh, John Hibbing, who comes from us from uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln, who's going to build again on the, on the previous two speakers and talk uh, about some of the core divisions between types of people and the physiological factors that may contribute to that. John. Well, it sounds de derivative since I'm the third one speaking, but I also would like to thank the organizers of this event. They treated us very well, uh, smoothly run. Uh, I enjoyed my hotel. Everything's great. Um, I also enjoyed being uh, on the panel with these uh, sharp people. I've already learned a lot, and it's great to talk to a, uh, an attentive uh, bunch who's actually interested in this. Sometimes I can't say that about my students, uh, interested in what I have to say. So uh, hopefully this will be uh, different. Well, I think uh, the organizers were... Uh, wise in, uh, in kind of having me go third because I, I do think I build off of what the first two speakers said, uh, but also take it in a slightly different direction. Um, I certainly agree with Mina that, that humans are group-based organisms, um, and I think this is very important. Uh, but you know, Mina and Alan are both psychologists, so they love to bring people to the lab and randomly assign them to one group or the other and, and do devious things to them. Uh, we tend to bring uh, random groups of people and do the same thing to all of them and then see if they behave differently. So I'm a kind of an individual difference guy. And uh, that's a dangerous thing to say in some respects. I mean, people get nervous about if we just talk openly about people really being different than other people. 
Um, but I'm not going to apologize for it because I think we need to get used to that. We need to be able to talk about differences without assuming that that means one is better than the other. And I think there are really deep differences between liberals and conservatives. But I think we have to be on guard to, to, to go that next step, to avoid going the next step and, and assuming that that means that one side is better than the other. You can do that you know, at home, but I'm not going to do that up here uh, in front of a mixed audience. Um, finally, the, the way I think that I might depart a little bit from, uh, from Alan and, and Mina is that um, I'm going to be focusing more on um, stability. And this, I guess, ties in with the notion that we have individual differences. And so I'm not saying that people are always the same, that, that they're genetically born a certain way and never vary. Um, but I do think that sometimes we might focus a little too much on certain events and their ability to change us. I don't know how many of you have been able to change, really change the, the ideological orientation of somebody else. Uh, I've tried it many times and failed. Uh, that's a difficult thing to do. Even something like 9-11, I'm, I'm glad Alan brought that up. Um, you know, the, the research shows very clearly that people changed fairly dramatically after 9-11. They became more conservative, especially in New York and northern New Jersey, so parts of, in most, some of the most liberal parts of the country. But the interesting thing is, a year and a half later, they're pretty much back where they were before. So, you know, there was change, but it sometimes doesn't last a long time. Uh, psychologists sometimes talk about a happiness set point, that the people ha might uh, uh, have an amputation of a limb, and they think, you know, my life's over. I'm, I'm never going to be as happy as I was. Well, a year later, it turns out they pretty much are about as happy as they were before the amputation. The same thing in reverse with regard to winning the lottery. People say, great, you know, my life's going to be fundamentally altered. I'm going to be happy now. Well, they're, they're no more happy a year later than they were before they won the lottery. So I think we do, we, and, and uh, translating this to politics, I think we have kind of a political set point that uh, doesn't mean it's immutable. It's, clearly, it's going to change. We're responsive to events, but uh, don't overestimate the degree to which we can respond to these things. So uh, the way I'm going to organize my talk is to uh, uh, spend the first half running through some research that my lab has done that suggests that liberals and conservatives are really different, not just different in their political beliefs, obviously, that's definitional, but they're different in the way they experience the world. Um, they really see things differently, and I think this is part of the frustration that a liberal and a conservative can be exposed to the same set of events and just come away with it as though they, they had seen and felt something really different. So I'm gonna go through several studies that illustrate this, and then I'm gonna spend the last part of my talk trying to step back and think a little bit about how this all fits together and some of the questions that Tim uh, mentioned in his opening remarks and that are in the title of this event, actually, that uh, can the, the divide be crossed, and, and if so, how? I'm gonna to try to address that just a little bit. All right, well, the first study I'm gonna tell you about uh, is also one that you can play along with a, a little bit to a certain extent. Uh, it's called the face in the crowd paradigm. And what's going to happen is on the next screen, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of faces. And all those faces have the same expression except one. So your job as a research participant is to hit your space bar, if you had one, um, as soon as you spot the oddball expression. Now, uh, since we don't have space bars, if you're in the mood and have a good view of the screen and your eyes are better than mine, you can raise your hand when you see the oddball uh, expression. But let's get, go through a couple of these, and then I'll tell you why we're doing this. All right, so here it is. Anybody see the one that doesn't fit? Yeah. yeah, okay, I see quite a few hands going up. Okay, so yeah, a uh, young lady here in the kind of lower left uh, has an angry look, and the rest of them are all, are all neutral expressions. Let's do, let's do one more of these, okay? So you're going to see the same thing on the next slide, a different oddball expression. Anybody spot where that one is? Yeah, yeah okay, good, people are doing it. So yeah, here now we're up in the upper right. You can see that. Uh, she's got a happy expression now. All right, so what's the point of this? Um, this is something that psychologists have done a lot of. Our lab was not the first one to do this, uh, this paradigm by any stretch. In fact, there's a very well-established finding, and that finding is that people are quicker to spot the oddball expression when it is an angry one than when it's a happy one. You know, I think we could all come, fairly quick, come up pretty quickly with an evolutionary explanation for why we might be uh, particularly uh, likely to spot the angry expression rather than the happy expression, but uh, on average, people do this. There's, there's no doubt about that. And by the way, uh, I just showed you this nice young redheaded lady. Um, we do this with uh, black people, white people. I mean, the, the faces up there, young, old, male, female, we, we vary that. We do this about 25 or 30 different sets of, of kinds of things, and that way you can average this all out. And we get the same thing that the psychologists for long, uh, for long uh, studies from long ago have done, uh, that there is definitely a privileging to the, the angry expression. But remember, I said I was interested in individual differences. So uh, what we noticed was that this is just an on average finding. There indeed is a lot of variation. Some people are about equal. In other words, they spot the uh, angry face really no more quickly than, people, than they spot the, the happy face. 
Then you have other people for whom the difference is really gigantic. In other words, they're really quick when the oddball expression is angry, and it takes them a long, long time to uh, click the space bar when the oddball expression is a happy one. Well, what might explain why some people um, are uh, one way and some people are another? Uh, you can think of the usual culpr culprits. We uh, use demographics. Uh, are older people more likely to spot the angry expression faster than a happy one? Uh, or males, females, people with lots of education, income, race, ethnicity. Uh, what about personality? You might think maybe somebody who's neurotic would be a little bit more likely to spot the, the uh, angry expression more quickly than they spot happy expressions. Well, we got pretty much no results on all these things. Bounces around a little bit in a couple of our samples. We found maybe hints of something going on, but for the most part, there's really not much there. But guess what? Uh, if we move on to uh, political views, which we've done, we then asked the people who were participants in our experiment, uh, a set of, I think in this particular one, there were 18 political items. Here's about half of them. Uh, you can see it's a pretty standard array, things that people tend to feel pretty strongly about. A lot of social issues, a couple economic issues. How do you feel about immigration, about gay marriage, about the death penalty, about legalizing marijuana, abortion, reducing spending on social welfare. And then we add these all together in traditional ways. We kind of all tend to know what a, a conservative believes and what a liberal believes as defined in the United States. So we do that. Uh, and then uh, you can guess the next step. We're going to correlate that with, uh, with what we saw before as far as how quickly people were able to spot emotions. First, we just looked at when the oddball expression was angry. So on the left, we have liberals. In the middle would be conservatives. Oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, moderates. And on the right would be conservatives. So, and remember, this is response time. So the lower the number, that means the quicker they were able to hit that. So conservatives are much more likely than liberals, about 300 milliseconds to uh, respond quickly to uh, an angry expression. Uh, uh, but what, maybe conservatives are just faster, right? So we have to look at happy phases, and then we see really a pretty startling difference. So there, conservatives are slower than liberals in uh, spotting the, the happy face. So uh, this is known as a negativity bias. And once again, sometimes when people hear this, they think that means if we're saying somebody has a bigger negativity bias, that means we must be saying something bad about them. Uh, I don't jump to that conclusion. There can be a very good reason to have a negativity bias. In fact, we all have it. I mean, on average, it's just that some have more than others, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. We use a device called an eye tracker, which is a pretty handy thing. You can put the gizmo on them and, and then show a computer screen, and you know exactly where the individual is looking on the computer screen. So our question here is not whether liberals and conservatives are faster to spot uh, a certain expression, angry or happy, but now we just want to know where they're looking, whether they look at pictures that are uh, pleasant or not pleasant, negative or positive. So on the next screen, I'm going to show you a, kind of a collage. It's actually just uh, four images in, in the quadrants of the screen. And we have people in eye trackers. By the way, one of them is kind of disgusting, so I don't know if, if anybody's squeamish. You know, we're academics. We have to be sensitive to these target warnings and all this these days. Uh, so uh, uh, there you go. That's a kind of nasty toilet, no, no doubt about that. Uh, a wrecked car, a rat, and then a beach ball. So this one happens to be three negative images and one positive image. A lot of our other ones are three positive, you know, birthday cakes, uh, sunsets, uh, whatever, uh, and uh, one negative, uh, and sometimes it's two and two. The important thing is every respondent sees the same stuff. So what we're interested in with the eye tracker is how long people dwell uh, on the positive images as opposed to the negative images. Here again, psychologists have told us that people have a negativity bias. We spend more time looking at negative things than positive things on average. But is there an individual difference? Well, here we just divided liberals and conservatives at the median. And uh, the, the fact that this is a positive bar for liberals means that, yes, even liberals do spend more time looking at negative images than positive images. But notice how much more uh, the gap is for conservatives. It's actually four times as much, uh, 1,600 milliseconds as opposed to 400 milliseconds. And again, this is the gap between how much time they dwell on the uh, negative as opposed to positive images. So conservatives spot the negative images more quickly. Uh, they dwell on them longer. Do they remember them? That was our next step. So uh, here we showed people uh, pictures, some positive, uh, like on the left, a jaunty baby, beautiful sunset. On the right, a couple negative images, uh, hurricane damage, uh, an infant uh, clearly distraught, probably malnourished. Uh, we had 200 of these, and we sh just showed them to people fairly quickly. Then we had them do a distractor task, and then we brought them back and we showed them 400 images, 200 of which were repeats and 200 of which were new. And their task was to tell us whether this was an image they'd seen before. So people could make a mistake a couple different ways by saying they'd seen it before when they hadn't, uh, or the other way around. Uh, and then we wanted to see, it turned out that liberals and conservatives were about equal at remembering images overall. 
It's not like conservatives are, are worse at remembering images. They're the same, but the, as far as the type of image, it really makes a difference. Conservatives uh, are much better at remembering the negative images. Liberals are better at remembering the positive images, as you can see for this uh, pretty steady increase. This is the gap, the negativity bias, the, the uh, degree to which they remember negative better than positive. Well, um, those are some nice kind of cognitive tests, but we wanted to take it to the next level and actually look at biology and physiology. Um, are people responding in a very tangible biological sense differently? So uh, my colleague Kevin Smith and I have a political physiology lab, which we're very proud of. And uh, you know, there are some pretty standard ways of measuring physiological response, arousal, um, arousal of the sympathetic nervous system. And one of the most common ways is electrodermal activity, which you can do pretty neatly with a couple of sensors on the fingers. So here we just show them one image at a time because we don't want to confuse them with a collage. So this is a positive image. Um, and by the way, there are sets of images that we can draw these from. Uh, they're pretty handy. They've been pre-rated. So some people might say, I hate skiing. How can you show that? And that's true. Uh, I mean, I showed one to an audience. It was a picture of a giraffe. And the guy said, oh, my uncle was stomped by a giraffe. <laughs> so, you know, this is why you show more than one image. You know, you want to get a general sense of positive and negative. So these have been pre-rated. Uh, people tend to think this is a positive thing. The lady going down a ski slope having a good time. This is a negative image, a, a, a dog bearing its fangs. So the question is, uh, you know, people have physiological responses to both positive and negative things. If I would show you a loved one you hadn't seen for a while, you'd have a positive, or sorry, I shouldn't say positive, a physiological response. If I show you a bear uh, coming close to you, you'd have a physiological response. What do we, what do we tend to respond to most? Here we change terminology a little bit, I'm sorry, but the blue line is for liberals. Aversive would be negative, like the dog uh, bearing its fangs, uh, and the appetitive would be positive, like the lady on the ski slope. You can see liberals respond pretty much the same physiologically, whether it's positive or negative. But then look at conservatives. Uh, there you see a much stronger physiological response for the negative images, such as the dog, uh, than they do for the positive images. We also get this in uh, uh, <clears throat> brain activation patterns. Uh, we're proud of this study because it included about 110 scans. As Amina knows, that's, uh, you know, it's tough to do. These, these are expensive projects. Um, uh, but we, what we found out was we could just uh, pretty much predict who is a liberal, who is a conservative, if you show us the brain activation patterns for certain images. In fact, we can do it with just one or two. Um, they're, they're that different. Um, I wasn't going to talk about how they're different because the, the neuroscientists we work with hates it when people do that. You know, they say, well, it's activating the anterior cingulate cortex, and that means this and this and this, because the brain is so complicated, it does lots of different things. But he's not here right now, and so I'm going to... Uh, uh, and since, since it came up in Mina's, Mina's talk, I just have to mention one thing. Uh, you see on the right the area where liberals have a greater brain activation than conservatives, and that turns out to be the somatosensory 2 region, which is a pain region of the brain. So if I would kick you in the shin, you'd have activation in the somatosensory 2, but guess what? You also would have it if you would see a picture of somebody stepping on a rusty nail. So there's an empathy component to this. So you know, one could at least spin a story here that, uh, that this kind of fits with some of our uh, stereotypes of liberals, that there might be a little bit more empathic response. As far as the anterior cingulate cortex, which we see activating a little bit more strongly for conservatives and liberals, um, that could be interpreted as part of the brain that really says something's wrong here, something unusual has happened, this is upsetting, uh, and the prefrontal cortex needs to swing into action. But the most important thing uh, is really, uh, you know, that there are differences, that we, we know who's a liberal, who's a conservative, just from looking at how they might respond to an image of a mutilated body, for example. All right, um, so you've been very patient as I went through the research uh, all too quickly, but now let's, let's step back and try to think about what, uh, what this might mean. So I would say that compared to others, some people are more attuned to and responsive to threats in the environment. Uh, for most of our time as human beings, uh, the most salient threats to our species have emanated from other humans, and specifically we mean outgroups, uh, you know, the tribe over the hill is going to come get us, uh, or in-group norm violators. So I think it's not surprising that this would be where we start to see the rubber hit the road in terms of political attitudes and in terms of this sensitivity to threat manifesting itself in a set of political views. So threat sensitivity individuals tend to favor public policies they believe will mitigate the threats posed by outgroups and by norm violators. Um, so here are some of the things that I think uh, people who are particularly threat sensitive would probably support, law and order. Uh, patriotism and unity, and I couldn't help but think of the whole Colin Kaepernick uh, episode right now. The kinds of people who think, you know, everybody should stand for the national anthem, we've got to stick together, are the people who tend to be threat sensitive. They're worried that if we don't stay together uh, in a patriotic kind of situation like that, then uh, it could be bad. 
People uh, who are threat sensitive tend to support traditional approaches to life. They like strong defense, uh, restriction on immigration. I think that would be consistent with this notion that they view uh, outgroups as potentially uh, threatening. Policies that will heighten the standing of the in-group. You know, we're going to win. We're going to defeat those, those other groups. Uh, maybe they're even willing to sacrifice some simple liberties for security and to go after firm punishment, such as uh, the death penalty. It's always been like this. Tim, I'm with you. Uh, he's absolutely right to point this out. That, you know, one of the things I like about this is that we're not saying that this has just come on the scene. John Stuart Mill long ago said, it is commonplace for political systems to have a party of order or stability and a party of progress or reform. Similarly, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the two parties which divide the state, the party of conservatism and that of innovation, are very old and have disputed the possession of the world ever since it was made. I get a lot of flack from my fellow political scientists because they see political issues as so idiosyncratic and unique, varying from country to country and era to era, um, that they think the kind of research I do just doesn't fit. And I think you, that's true at one level, at the issues of the day, but a lot of times lurking behind issues of the day are these bedrock dilemmas you know, how do we, that, that we've wrestled with since before we were living in mass agricultural societies, the hunter-gatherer groups of 80 and 100. We had to wrestle with uh, you know, these issues of about the, the threats from outgroups and in-group norm violators, how we're going to be led. Should it be th a firm, authoritative leader, or should we be uh, consulting lots of people? Uh, so that's, that's always been with us. Um, I hesitated about this slide, but I decided to be maybe, uh, I'm not sure I believe this, but you know, sometimes you just have to talk through and see if, if it flies or not. But I do think these kinds of issues we're talking about, more group-based threat sensitivity kinds of things, are probably more important, no, I don't want to say more important, are more organic, you know, th this is really where it is, than some issues like, like the economy, taxes, size of government, climate change. I mean, how many people have wrestled to try to get people to realize how important climate change is? Uh, and it's, it's an uphill battle. Regulations, even trade policies, you know, and, and people might say, well, trade is a really big issue for Donald Trump. But if you listen to him, I don't think it's an economic policy so much. It's, it's really very social and very group-based. And here I got one of his quotes, you know, that uh, the Mexico and, and China, they're killing us, and we've got to kill them. <laughs> He's like, we've got to, you know, start winning again. So I think uh, for him, it's, it's really less uh, kind of economic issues than, uh, than social. I think the same thing is true of social welfare attitudes. A lot of that is extremely social and not economic. Who do you visualize as receiving social welfare benefits? That goes a long way toward explaining whether or not you support expansion of, of welfare. So uh, here we get to the, the key point. To me, the divide in 2016 seems so raw and intense because more than most elections, it mimics the core primal group-based chasm that flows from variations in threat sensitivity and has bedeviled humans throughout history. And here again, I can go back to Tim. You know, some of the things he mentioned, like the Civil War or anti-lynching laws, there you're back to this kind of group-based thing. I think that's where it really gets uh, incredibly intense. If we're battling over... Um, you know, whether to extend the Bush-era Bush tax cuts, we can get pretty worked up about that, but it just doesn't quite have the same gut-level response. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so can we cross the divide? No. <laughs> uh, so maybe I'm trying to rival Alan for being doom and gloom, but actually, uh, I don't think I am. Because uh, we can't, I, I don't think we can. I think this runs very deep. Uh, uh, it might be partially genetic, it doesn't have to be. To me, what's important is that it's biologically instantiated at some, at some level. So maybe it was a, a set of searing environmental experiences that you really internalized. Uh, I really don't care if it's genetic or not. What I do think is it's like a super tanker, and these ideological orientations are extremely difficult to change, especially in the short term. So what do we do? I think we have to learn to live with it. Here are two suggestions, which uh, maybe we can pursue in the Q&A if you're interested, They're intended to be a little bit uh, controversial. First, I think we should focus less on deliberation and more on compromise. It sounds like a crazy thing to say. Shouldn't we talk this through? Can't we? If we just get together and work it out, won't, it, won't we be able to do it? No, I think uh, Mina was right to point out that sometimes we actually go backwards when uh, we, we uh, try to do that. Uh, we can dig in our heels and it, it becomes very upsetting. But I think at some point you just need to say, these people experience the world differently than I do, therefore we're going to cut this loaf in half. We have to recognize that, accept it, as frustrating as it is. Uh, that's all we can do. Second, we need to work on tolerating and respecting those on the other side, understanding that they experience the world differently. You know, we've got rose-colored glasses and uh, fear goggles. You know, conservatives love to say liberals just don't get it. And I think they're right. You know, liberals don't get it because there's nothing for them to get. They don't see threats. They don't feel threats in the same way that conservatives do. Likewise, when liberals say conservatives, they're just you know, constructing boogeymen behind rocks everywhere. Um, well, no, they just, uh, they just feel these threats in a very different way. So I think if we accept the biological differences, I'm you know, talking with uh, Alan and Mina ahead of time, maybe this is naive, uh, but at least there's the hope that, that maybe that acceptance uh, 
um, that it's a basic biological feature could help. You know, think of some of the things where it has helped. Uh, mental disabilities. You know, we used to think that was a, a possessed by the devil or a bad parenting. Once we realized it was a biological feature, uh, people became much more tolerant. Sexual orientation, of course, the big issue now has been demonstrated that those people who believe sexual orientation is biologically based are more tolerant. Even left-handedness, you know, that used to be, uh, you thought you were lazy, had bad habits, we just need to hit you with a ruler and you'll, you'll get it right. Now we recognize it's very different. Uh, we can't even do our brain scans with a mixture of left and right-handed people. That's how different they are biological. We have to pick one or the other. So, um, you know, this is my best, the, the best I can do is to think that maybe if we recognize the depth of these things, that we'll actually be a little bit more tolerant of, of people, a little bit more willing to compromise. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for another fascinating presentation. I'm learning a lot uh, tonight, so I hope all of you are as well. And uh, John, I also want to say I'm very grateful whenever a political scientist uh, acknowledges a historian said something worthwhile. So that was a good moment for me. Thank you. Uh, and uh, our fourth distinguished guest is uh, my colleague Larry Bobo, who's going to talk about uh, inequality and, and racial identity and, and, and racism and how it functions and plays into our contemporary political a moment, and I'm sure other things as well. Larry. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to be here uh, this evening. And uh, now for something completely different. Um, this is going to be a PowerPoint-free presentation and far more scripted than what has preceded. Uh, prejudice and politics have been intertwined in the U.S. throughout my lifetime. One could say the same, indeed, about the full arc of the development and transformation of the United States of America. Yet the current moment truly does feel like a time of acute polarization and unexpectedly and indigestible realized, uh, racialized divisions. We're nearing the end of the second term for a now quite popular African-American president, yet large fractions of the population believe that race relations are steadily worsening. Part of the reason for the acute concern and puzzlement over the tenor of this pre-presidential election moment is I think too many of us have drunk the Kool-Aid. Accordingly, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement eliminated racism and discrimination as serious problems in the American body politic. The election of Barack Obama as the 44th and first African American president signaled to many as nothing else could the dawning of the post-racial era in the US. Even though I believe sophisticated observers and analysts truly know better, I'm convinced that this post-racial fantasy is a highly influential, if not prevailing, understanding of the American racial landscape. Surely it will not surprise many of you here this evening, but America has neither shed nor, in my estimation, ever honestly confronted its legacy of white supremacy. There are deep, ongoing, and highly adaptive conditions of racial discrimination and racism at the institutional, cultural, and individual levels that prefigure and play out in our national political discourse. Yet, there are strong prohibitions today against direct, honest discourse on these issues. Now, scholars will surely look back on these times and observe, as the philosophers of race Robert Gooding Williams and Charles Mills have recently written, quote, it was the most post-racial of times, it was the least post-racial of times. Uh, I believe that only when we get beyond the fallacy of color blindness and the distorting narrative of post-racialism can we hope to rise to a point of honest, clear-eyed engagement with how and why politics, prejudice, and polarization so deeply royal our democracy and collective lives. In the brief time I have, I want to draw attention to three deep points of tension in our social fabric uh, that have enormous implications for the current political moment. These are, number one, tensions arising from the simultaneous growth of income and wealth inequality with the growth in ethno-racial diversity. Secondly, the tensions arising from the significant civil rights gains for minorities and yet the worsening of some forms of racial inequality in the U.S. And thirdly, the tensions arising from deepening partisanship and what has become, in fact, the routine racialization, racialization of our politics, especially at the national level. Item one. For most of the period from 1945 to 1973, as our economy grew, the gap between the most affluent and the least affluent actually shrunk. That is, as the pie grew and incomes grew for everyone, those in the middle and lower reaches of the economic hierarchy actually did slightly better than the well-off. 
A different story has characterized the post-1973 period, especially the post-1980 era. As our economy has grown, especially in this post-Great Recession period, a disproportionate share of income and wealth has gone upward to the already most well-off segments of the population. As a recent report from the Institute for Policy Studies emphasized, quote, income disparities have become so pronounced that America's top 10% now average nearly nine times as much income as the bottom 90%. Moreover, the top 1% of the population now holds a share of wealth roughly equivalent to what existed at the time of the onset of the Great Depression. For much of the past two decades, the real value of income stagnated for the middle of the income distribution, and those in the lower quintiles actually saw their purchasing power decline. These economic trends have consequences as more and more Americans experience a sense of economic vulnerability and feel as if they will not be able to pass better prospects onto their children. At the same time, beginning with the immigration reforms of 1965, the US population began a period of remarkable change. We've witnessed a sharp rise in the share of the population coming from Asia and or Latin America, as well as other parts of the globe. Figures compiled by Brookings Institute senior fellow William Fry show that 64% of the US population could be classified as white in 2010. By 20, uh, between 2010 and 2050, that percentage is expected to substantially decline. Indeed, his figures suggest that sometime between 2040 and 2050, like almost exactly 2044, uh, the US will be a majority minority population. We hit one important landmark five years ago when for the first time beginning in 2011, the majority of new births were children of color. As Fry points out with a dem demographer's knack for understatement, quote, this is hardly the America that large numbers of today's older and middle-aged adults grew up with in their neighborhoods, workplaces, and civic lives. Experimental research shows that when presented with evidence of these demographic trends, white Americans tend to express a greater sense of threat from minorities and a greater emotional animosity toward them. Moreover, some of this work, in fact, shows that drawing attention to this demographic trend for white Americans has direct political effects. Maureen Craig and Jennifer Richardson found that it, through experimental uh, manipulation of the awareness of the racial population shift increases white identification with conservative political ideologies and with the Republican Party. Drum roll, enter Donald Trump. It should surprise no one then that this nexus of conditions, sharply rising inequality, an increasingly acute sense of economic vulnerability for lower and indeed even many middle income Americans in the context of what has been rapid change in our ethno-racial landscape as we open the door to powerfully, opens the door to a powerfully resonant blend of anti-minority populism. Item two. The great successes of the 1960s in civil rights seemed to fade into the background. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, as well as the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, hearkened a new era that some have literally dubbed the Minority Rights Revolution. The basic civil rights of minorities were authoritatively affirmed, and the right to enter the country without restrictive based uh, national origin quotas opened our borders to all nations equally. In the eyes of many, these legislative, institutional, and related cultural changes are profoundly consequential. They arguably ushered into place a new colorblind social order. Uh, the old explicitly race and gender barriers in our labor markets and within our educational uh, institutions that once defined who had access to certain types of jobs or certain programs have largely fallen by the wayside. The number of minorities elected to uh, holding elective offices today at an all-time high. And despite craven and pathetic attempts to create second and third generation barriers, significant hindrances to minority electoral participation seem faded for the ash heap of history. And as I've already noted, the makeup of our population has changed enormously. In more concrete material terms, we've witnessed a remarkable growth in the size, prominence, and influence of the black middle class. Since the mid-1960s, there's been a five-fold increase in the number of blacks who we can classify as in genuinely economically comfortable circumstances, with incomes exceeding the poverty level by a factor of five or more. I don't want to be overly sanguine. Many powerful studies reveal persistently high black-white gaps in unemployment and in rates of poverty. Moreover, there's compelling evidence that discrimination in the labor and housing market still occurs with discouraging frequency, though the sort of categorical color bars of the Jim Crow era are indeed a thing of the past. But some core features of the racial landscape were hardly touched by the minority rights revolution. America remains a deeply racially segregated nation. 
Recent studies uh, uh, by distinguished so sociologist and demographer Doug Massey indicate that at the current rate of change, African Americans will remain highly segregated from whites for at least another 50 years. Some trend data point to increasing segregation for segments of the Latino and Asian population. Our communities and neighborhoods are still profoundly mapped by racial background. More than this, however, in some respects that Americans prefer not to recognize, a couple racial divides have actually gotten materially much worse over the last several decades. First, and now finally in full public view, we as a nation underwent a truly historic incarceration binge. An incarceration binge so extreme that the U.S. now incarcerates per capita more of its own people than any other nation on planet Earth. According to a widely influential Pew report, by 2007, one in 100 American adults was in jail or prison or under some form of criminal justice supervision. The binge of incarceration fell with radical disproportionality on the African American population. When the new millennium started, the black to white incarceration rate had risen to a shocking eight to one. The same Pew report showed that the black male incarceration rate was not one in 100, it was one in 15. And that for younger black men aged 25 or less, it was a full one in eight. The incarceration binge reached such extremes in poor urban black communities that sociologists, my colleagues at Harvard, now write of incarceration as becoming part of the expected life course experience. Discussions of inequality tend to focus on, that's worsening racial divide number one, tend to focus on access to jobs and employment, earnings and incomes and types of work performed. The past two decades, have, however, have seen renewed emphasis on wealth accumulated financial assets and resources, not just jobs and incomes. Path-breaking work in this arena conducted by sociologists Melvin Oliver and Tom Shapiro in their classic book. They show that in the mid-1980s, the gap in wealth, median wealth between white and black households was a remarkable 11 to one. Thus, for roughly every dollar of wealth or assets in white hands in America, African Americans had about 10 cents. The arena of wealth, however, is another dimension where distinctly racial inequality sharply worsened in recent years. As one might expect, the great expansion in the stock market over the course of the 90s largely benefited those who already had the wealth to invest. Even more consequentially, however, recent work shows that while all Americans took a hit during the Great Recession, the wealth holdings of black and Latino Americans were thoroughly devastated. The median net worth of white households declined by 16% between 2005 and 2009, according to a Pew study. The decline involved a loss of fully 66% for median Latino households and 53% for median black households. Black and Latino wealth holding, unlike white wealth holding, consists almost exclusively of home ownership. Moreover, because of racial residential segregation, black and Latinos were particularly vulnerable to predatory subprime lending practices. Thus, as real estate lost value, as foreclosures soared, it was blacks and Latinos who took the largest hit, again, by orders of magnitude. Thus, the 11 to 1 wealth ratio that Oliver and Shapiro pointed to from the mid-1980s ballooned up to a figure in excess of 20 to 1 ratio today. Assuming current trends continue, one recent article estimated it would take black Americans 228 years to accumulate as much wealth as white Americans possess today in this moment. Bottom line, it's not surprising in the least that our politics continues to have racial overtones. Our social and economic fabric are still too profoundly unequal by ethno-racial background to think that our politics would not in some fashion or form be affected by such enormous structural disparities in conditions in terms of neighborhoods of residents, treatment by the criminal justice system, and the material underpinnings of economic well-being. <clears throat> Item three, final point here. Racial inequality does not, however, mean that race has to map onto our basic political affiliations and choices. Indeed, if we were to go back to the presidential contests of 1956 or of 1960, you would find that the major party platforms of the Republican and Democratic parties contain largely similar language about issues of civil rights and race. Indeed, both parties at that time still actively competed for the black vote. Surprise, surprise there was no necessary connection between partisanship and party outlook or program. Beginning with the 1964 election, however, the two major parties began to sharply diverge on issues of civil rights and race. The Democratic Party clearly became, at least in public perception, 
and, and legislative action, the party of effective governmental enforcement of full citizenship rights for minorities. With it, we have witnessed a sea change in partisan alignments. The South went from being largely solidly Democratic controlled to largely Republican controlled. Black loyalty to the party of Lincoln, once something you could take for granted, started to weaken significantly during the Franklin Roosevelt and New Deal era, accelerated under President Kennedy, and vanished and was replaced by near complete capture by the Democratic Party in subsequent years. An unfortunate effect of these developments is that both major parties, to a degree, depend on racial division for their electoral success. On the one hand, then, in a context in which Republicans are content to completely cede the black vote, Democrats only need do so much to expect black loyalty. After all, where else can black voters go? So even under Obama, nothing you could construe as a truly strong minority or black agenda gets articulated within the confines of major party politics. On the other hand, especially as the population changes, the Republican Party worries about mobilizing its base and doing what it can to constrain the influence of Democratic voters, a great many of whom happen to be minorities. Not only is race increasingly aligned with voting and party identification, but political scientists and political psychologists have shown us that attitudes of racial resentment, which actually, contrary to what Alan said, are measured very well in surveys and predict voting and political behavior with astonishing accuracy, play a strong, stronger role than in the past in defining party attachments. The end result is what legal scholar Ian Haney Lopez calls dog whistle politics, particularly on the part of the right. Given improved racial attitudes and the success of the civil rights era, openly bigoted appeals are fraught with risk of backfiring, but carefully crafted slogans and rhetoric that play on underlying racial resentments and sensitivities has become an entirely routine staple of Republican Party politics. Thus, in Nixon's 1968 campaign, we get the Southern strategy and the first big time law and order message. In 1980, we see Reagan literally go from the Republican convention to Philadelphia, Mississippi to launch his campaign to the city where the civil rights workers Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were killed, and it gives a speech on the importance of states' rights. He also frequently deploys the welfare queen stereotype or that of the strapping young buck using government-provided food stamps and welfare to buy steaks. By 1988, we get Willie Horton. In 2010 and 2012, we hear chants of taking America back. From who and what, you fill in the blank. Viewed in this light, the rhetoric of the Trump comp campaign is not some strange aberration or break with a happy post-racial past, but merely the next iteration in a worrisome pattern and trend. The racially tinged spat, uh, spasm of reaction against passage of the Affordable Care Act, the emergence of the Tea Party, the solidification of Republican intransigence in the House and Senate must, in part, be read through a racial lens. And now, the openly bigoted demonization of the Hispan those of Hispanic heritage, especially Mexican Americans by Donald Trump, would be astounding, except it is largely of a piece with the longstanding practice of dog whistle politics involving tacit racial appeals we've seen now for 40 years. Bottom line, we inhabit a troubling moment in terms of the alignment of race and racial policy and related policy commitments with our basic deeply institutionalized two-party system. This is not a healthy circumstance. Well, where is the change we've been waiting for? <laughs> There's been a lot of pessimism up here. I'm not going to change that. Um, <clears throat> it's not my point, however, to sound an unremittingly pessimistic note. If there are takeaways here, they are perhaps threefold. First, the current moment is one best read as complex. Positive change in our institutions, positive change in our norms, and positive change in the outlooks and attitudes of the mass of Americans have been significant, and these are not easily overridden or turned back. There are clearly contending political alliances, no one overarching simplistic axis of intolerance, explicit or implicit, exists. It's just not out there. If anything, a two-term Obama presidency signals something important about the majoritarian character of the mass public at present, underlying racial inequality and division notwithstanding. Second, the success of the Trump candidacy to this current moment of apparent implosion should worry us all the same. In the context of economic anxiety and rising inequality, of population change, of enduring cultural racism and sometimes worsening racial inequality, we should never be comfortable assuming the demagoguery, especially as tied to core political institutions like our major political parties, is something that needn't arouse our serious concern or that should not be resisted and fought against with the greatest vigor. <clears throat> 
It is easy to envision scenarios where this political contest would remain extremely close and where the tilt of the next generation of social policy might bring great reversals. Be on your guard, fight it, articulate the alternative message. Third, as such, I want to reiterate the point I started on that race has always been an ingredient of American national politics. Its salience, explicitness, and centrality, and the ultimate political outcome have varied from one election cycle to the next. There is no constant rooted in uh, biology or circumstance. Uh, we must, in my mind then, shake off the blinding cloak of this post-racial fantasy. The only way to make progress on racial issues is to really face them directly and honestly. Assuming that these inequalities, identities, and divisions are not there or are somehow naturally healing themselves is a deeply serious error. Let's not wait for a Trump-like threat to realize there's much work that still needs to be done. Thank you. Ask my colleagues to come join me here around this, these lovely tables, the water. Uh, we know that we uh, are a little bit short on time here, so I, I am going to cut down our conversation a bit so that we can get to the uh, conversation with all of you. And so I want to just cut right to the chase, first by thanking each of you and all of you for such fascinating and wide-ranging discussions. And I wanted to start with uh, a question that I think brings together some of the themes that you all were uh, bringing together of, of, of empathy, of, of threat, of in-groups and out-groups, and also of the kinds of inequalities and structural uh, dynamics, Larry, that you were talking about more explicitly in your, in your talk. When, with respect to empathy, one of the things that was interesting to me is the way that you were talking about its limits had something to do with the fact that um, the, 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 the threats from outside were perceived as coming from groups of people that were not well known and with whom people had very little contact in some ways because of segregation, because of uh, regional distributions, demographic distributions, and so forth. So I'm wondering, does empathy have more possibility once it leaves the, uh, the in-group because one has had more exposure, whether it's intimately or in a neighborhood or in some kind of a workplace or what have you, to the out-group. Does, does empathy become more robust when it sort of leaves the context of the in-group, whether it's policed by threat or, 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 or affiliation or what have you? So if we could just maybe. Well, I guess I'll start. So I think that there are a couple, I think that of course there's the potential for empathy to help bridge divides or at least narrow gaps with individuals, but empathy by virtue of the environment in which it evolved is really about one person to another. Right. Our empathy didn't evolve in a situation where we were thinking about caring about statistics. Mm -hmm. So millions of people. And so trying to leverage that capacity to address something like an entire cultural ethnic group or, na or nation is asking a lot of a capacity that wasn't by design mm -hmm. evolving in that manner. That said, of course you can empathize with individuals from outgroups. One of the biggest challenges, however, is understanding whether or not that can then, that person doesn't become the exception to the rule, right. but rather that those compassionate feelings generalize to the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I would say that I think is important to note is that a lot of times our empathic processes can backfire because they not only highlight for us, well, what, what is the suffering of our own group? Um, when we realize the suffering of other groups, it's not always compassion that results. Sometimes it results in personal distress. I don't know about all of you, but the, the second I hear, for example, the opening strands of In the Arms of the Angel by Sarah McLaughlin when the ASPCA commercial comes on the TV oh, yeah. in the holiday, I am scrambling to find my remote and change the channel because I cannot bear to watch it again. I think when people oh, see, are... I want to adopt a dog. <laughs> right. You're yeah. a better person yeah. than I am. I think, you know, and then when you're confronted about the reality, some of the statistics yeah. that, you know, both Tim and Larry were, were giving us this evening, I think personal distress is often a common response that a lot of people have because they're not sure what they can do. And mm -hmm. so I think uh, we're, we're probably best advised to generate more compassion than personal distress to the best that we can and then also focus on addressing institutional barriers rather than just trying to get everybody to feel for each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, just to add a little bit to that, one way that I like to think about this is 
we are empathic towards people that we think are, that we judge to be deserving of our passion, right. uh, our compassion. So I think right. justice plays a lot a role in this. So I think right. one answer here is it's, if you can highlight for people that a person's going through um, a difficult tragedy, and if you could try to make the, their, their suffering as an individual, as a person rather than as a group member salient, Right. Um, but I think that like, we like to think with moderators that if, if I don't see the person as deserving of my compassion, that it could, it could boomerang. And just one other thing to find, um, this is similar to what Paul Bloom has argued, mm -hmm. this boomerang or this, this ironic effect of empathy, we find that it's, it's this automatic emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. And if you can get people to respond in a more cognitive mm -hmm. way, that I think that's where the hook is, is to get people to understand the others rather than have this emotional reaction of like, yuck, or they're mm -hmm. not one of us. Well, and I guess one of the things before, I, I want both of you to weigh in here too, but one of the things I was trying to get at is that if the, th if the threat is really a perception that's based and rooted, based on and rooted in a prejudice, whether it's implicit bias that's been shaped in some way or explicit prejudices towards groups that come not from any kind of intimate or direct relationship or knowledge of or contact with that group of people, but it comes from this sort of perception that they are going to do some kind of harm. Is it possible to move beyond that by, by dismantling structures of equality so that more people are in contact with each other in more ways? And we see this playing out physically in the way that we're segregated in various ways. We also see it playing out culturally in the way that we're siloed in our in social media and the algorithms that Facebook uses, et cetera. I'm wondering, is there a way to push beyond that so that empathy has a chance, I guess? Yeah. I don't know how many of you remember the confirmation hearings for Sandra Sotomayor, but uh, you know, she made the statement that as an underprivileged Latina, I will be able to feel empathy for an entire group of people that mm. you know, historically has not been perceived as very deserving of empathy, or not given it at least. Yeah. Well, this led to a really fascinating debate, I thought, uh, whereas a lot of conservatives made the case that empathy is a bad thing, right. uh, especially for a judge. You know, we need the judge to, to administer the law objectively and without getting all these emotions to confuse things. And I think there are a lot of ordinary people that, that same way that are a little bit suspicious of empathy. It's gonna, gonna jimmy up the works in mm -hmm. a way that's uh, inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm continuing to play my individual difference yeah. role tonight, but yeah. I do think we have that complicating factor as well, that, mm -hmm. that I don't think we should assume that everybody views empathy as something that really is desirable and that would make society better. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I, I guess I wanna argue against a bit of treating empathy either as something as a trait that individuals have or yeah. as the only lever we have to play, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's terribly important, even in a group context, even on a very big stage. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, the movie Selma and the protests in real life that happened on the Edmund Pettus Bridge when you know, a group of marshals and sheriff yeah. weigh into a, growl, a crowd of praying civil rights protesters disgusted a planet. The world was watching. People yeah. who had not supported right. civil rights legislation like Gerald R. Ford at the time, right. like Everett Dirksen at the time, called Lyndon Johnson and said, done, Enough. write it, this shouldn't happen. <laughs> right? right. Uh, there are ways in which you can mobilize empathy that are quite consequential to helping propel profound changes in a political context. Right. Now, that isn't necessarily easy to do because, it's again, you're not seeking individuals who have the trait and activating it. You're trying to get a situation where empathy really does arouse recognition of common humanity where that recognition had not been there before. And I think we're on the verge of that now with something like the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, no one can make the case, I think, in the course of rational argument, much less emotionally, that a guy who was selling loose cigarettes should now be dead. Right. Why Eric Garner is dead is a travesty. It's shocking. It's wrong. And the more film footage we get of that kind of thing, I fully, this is a movement that's not gonna stop and it will eventually prevail. Yeah. because our standards for legitimate police use of deadly force are clearly profoundly problematic when people who are not committing serious felonies end up dead and no one is sanctioned. That's right. But I, can I ask you a question? Because I'd be interested in what you have to say and what anybody has to say. I read an article yesterday, Mike.com, that said that white skepticism and, uh, and resistance to Black Lives Matter is on par with white attitudes towards the civil rights movement right. in 64 and 65. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, and now Martin Luther King's revered figure. That's right. That's right. Uh, so you have right. to risk that isolation. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it was profoundly courageous acts at the moment they launched them, mm -hmm. uh, but now kind of taken for granted. Yeah. Muhammad Ali was very nearly sent to prison for yeah. deciding he was not going to go against his religion and go to the war in Vietnam, and he dies one of the most revered heroes right. of the last century. Right, but there's I also mean, a reason why he got <laughs> shot, right? Yeah, yep, yeah, that's yeah, right, yeah. That's right, that's yeah. right. Um, let me ask the panel, open that up, building on that. Is why, it, it, maybe, is race one of the major kind of issues here when we talk about in-group, out-group identity in terms of th threat, empathy, et cetera, many of the things you've been talking about. Why is race such a stumbling block? Why does it continue to be, if not the biggest problem with respect to the, the things you're researching, but, but certainly one of them? Why does it endure? Well, I think the, um, I think sociologists, psychologists, scholars disagree on this, but it's certainly, at least in our culture for sure, race is one, one thing you focus on, uh, that's less true or, or perhaps not uh, true at all in other cultures. Um, mm. For example, in other cultures, um, Ireland, UK in the 1960s, it was more about religion. Right. So it's, it's context bound. Having said that, I think there's lots of reasons we do attend to ethnicity. There's a salient um, skin color and so on and so forth. But um, I don't see it as bi biological or genetic or evolutionary destiny. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, you know, just to make this more concrete, we all have friends who of a different ethnicity, and you don't meet them and say, "Oh, Bob, I, you're you're African American." You just he's Bob. I mean, just you. They're they're the salience of of their ethnicity becomes less lower because you learn other things about that individual through familiarity. So, I don't know. I, I think there's strong reasons why we pay attention to race and ethnicity, but it's not destiny. Mm -hmm. it, it can be overcome. Mm -hmm. I would add, in addition to the race being visually salient, the visual, you can't ignore the cues to group membership in this case. And what makes race different, for example, for, uh, sorry, from gender and age is that gender represents a biological interdependence that's not present right. for race. And age is everyone, you know, hopefully will have been an in-group and an out-group member at some stage in their yeah, life. Right, and right. so it's it one of few categories that. where you have visual cues mm -hmm. to group membership that doesn't include these other interdependencies or inevitabilities. Well, that's interesting, yeah. There is an economist at Harvard named Alberto Alessina who's got a famous study, a cross-national study, showing that the more heterogeneous a society is, the lower the welfare benefits are. The relationship is staggering. It's almost perfect. So a lot of these Scandinavian countries where it might appear as though race is not an issue, simply because the, in years past at least, yeah, there, yeah, there weren't that many. Yeah. That's right. So uh, I'm standing by it. Uh, you know, I think we're groupish organisms. Race is a handy stand-in for, for a group. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not destiny, but it's something we really have to work hard at if we're going to put it behind us. Right, right. Well, and it obviously varies. The meaning of race varies in different contexts. Right. Um, and even in the American experience, uh, it varies enormously. Right. We're all used to this black-white dichotomy, but that wasn't the case. It's easy to forget that the 1870, 1880, 1890 censuses included categories for colored or Negro, mulatto, quadroon, right. and octoroon. octoroon right, right. By 1920, by the time we fully implemented Jim Crow, it was just black-white. Right. And it makes you wonder what happened to all those <laughs> four million multiracial people. Right. Did they vanish right. from the country? Right. No, we forced them into the black cat. So there's always yeah. been enormous heterogeneity. Oh, they pass, they pass, enormous, right? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they passed into one category yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or the other. Yeah. So the point is those boundaries are, are, first of all, highly fluid and contextually dependent. And we're ignoring another second dimension here, which is a lot of this is about power and exploitative relationships. Right. Uh, and in the absence, I mean, one of the reasons I think the current polarization, as the historian told us, is not nearly as acute as in the past, is that no one has a property interest in the racial divide of the sort that existed in the slave era, right. uh, where an entire mode of economic organization and the wealth holding of huge sections of the population right. resided in other human bodies. Right. So we're not going to get to that kind of cataclysmic conflict right. again, right. I don't expect, right. though there's a lot to fight over in ways in which things can still turn in very unfortunate directions if we don't bring some pretty sophisticated thinking and political operation uh, to the challenge. Yeah, and to your point, too, law and public policy that no longer makes it okay for someone to own someone and hold right. someone against their will and work against their will. Good. Um, 
We're going to open it up now for some questions from the audience. It's hard for me to see. Yeah, that, really oh, oh here we go. Yeah, Very right, good. We go. uh, <laughs> that was such a strange so much experience. better than light. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have some folks who are going to be going around with microphones. Because we're videotaping this, we want to make sure that we get it recorded to so wait for the mic. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Who wants to go first? So, okay, right here. This question yeah. right here. Hi. So... Um, can you talk some about how religion differences play into this? Because religion is one of those categories where it's not clear that you can actually visually see it. And with the rise of Islamophobia that has happened in this country, which is often based on, you know, even if you're not Muslim, if you're Sikh and you have a turban, people assume it. So we're relying on visual cues. Right. And, and yet, along with that, anti-Semitism has gone up four or five-fold even though the, all the talk has been about Muslims and, is, and Islam, we've actually seen those divisions happen based on religion, which is a category that highly polarized, and yet you can't visually see it. So I'd be right. curious as to what any of the research shows about why that happens. Yeah. Anyone want to take that? Well, I, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I think that you, it's true that religion doesn't have that visual um, element to it. Um, you, can't, uh, you can't readily see whether a person's Catholic or Protestant. Um, I'm not a religion research expert, but I guess I'm going to say some, something anyway. But I think there's indirect cues of religiosity. It's the way you know where uh, a neighborhood where, where that person comes from or the way they dress. Um, and I think that it doesn't have a, that visual immediacy of, of race and ethnicity, but certainly um, by within probably a few you know, sentences or if you've been around this person for a relatively short period of time, you, you infer their religious background. Now, this is very contextualized. It depends on the era, the historical area, the culture, but I think that um, it's not as visual as, as, as in this ethnicity, but it's, it's, um, people leap to that conclusion very quickly. But. Yeah, and I guess I would add to that, one has to be very mindful about what leadership and people in positions of power do. Because as you know, right. when religious difference, as you say, may not be visible, but let's say the state decides to make you wear a yellow star mm -hmm. That's right. uh, and mark you as of a particular religion, then all manner of pernicious influence can flow from that, or that you are now listed among those who have to be subject to extreme vetting um, or you know, what, yeah. whatever the imposition of state power might be uh, that attempts to mark you uh, in some fashion. And then in some ways, uh, that's significant. I think the one other dimension here is that a lot of the reasoning in these political disputes seems to me to have a religious quality to it. Uh, not just that it attaches to members of other religions, but that it, it, some positions are taken kind of ex-cathedra because my church has said so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not, not much further cognitive uh, elaboration or foundation mm -hmm. is required. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. This, I'm turn this to a question for John at some point that, in uh, this class that I teach, I, we often bring up the question, this divide between conservative liberal and liberals broadly defined, to what extent is that actually a stand-in or correlated with the divide of religious conflict? Since in our culture, self-reported religiosity, broadly defined, does correlate with mm -hmm. ideology. So, um, yeah. yeah. I, I think people who are threat sensitive are very eager to ballyhoo their own belief and to be suspicious of anybody who thinks and looks and acts differently than they do. Not everybody's like that. I mean, I th maybe all are to a certain extent, but, but the degree really varies substantially. And so I think we're on our guard, uh, a lot of people are, to find those so subtle differences, even if it not, might not be in skin color. Yeah. Do we add? Do we add? Yeah. Okay, let's go for another question. If you have a particular question for a particular panelist, uh, feel free to, to note that as well. Yep. Next question, oh, okay. center second to your left. Okay. I see race as the major divisive issue used by the 1% to keep the 99% fighting each other rather than, there's an old movie called Blue Collar where the Yafet Koto character in the movie says, they keep us divided so we'll fight each other rather than fight right. the union officials or fight the company. Would you comment please? Mm. Well, I don't know, I might well let the historian yeah, do this. I mean, I think at, at, at the era of the, initial erection of the Jim Crow order, there was a lot of truth to that. Right. I mean, there were the old planter class, mm 
really trying to preserve uh, its power and wealth. There were many inklings of a way in which uh, the newly freedmen, the slaves, and poor agricultural working whites might have started to get together, and that was quickly perceived as a threat. Mm -hmm. And once federal authority was withdrawn from the southern states, they acted quickly to articulate this message, no, you are different from them. You have a privilege that they right. don't deserve. You're at a station that's above them. Don't throw your lot in, in with them. I have a much harder time reading the current context as one where that operates, certainly not in the straightforward way. If, if, if there is a way in which it works, it's the following sense. We have a Republican Party that has traditionally been more uh, the party of business and corporate elites, and that there's an agenda there which doesn't always have that much in common with uh, taking care of the working class and, and the poor. And uh, they have preserved their political viability in part through appeals to racial division, right? That, that their base would be smaller than it is if they had to strictly stand on their kind of economic platform. Uh, but if it's an economic platform mm -hmm. linked to law and order, prizing you and your values over those undeserving lazies over there who are trying to get your tax dollars, um, that that broadens the coalition for an agenda that they seek to pr uh, pursue. I would, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say related to that, there's this interesting phenomenon called the last place aversion effect. And mm -hmm. so there's this interesting political puzzle. Why do low socioeconomic status whites somehow support policy that seems to work exactly against them? And in large part, it seems right. to be driven by maintaining however low you are on the totem pole, just making sure you are not dead last. Right. And so in, by, by in appealing- In the status hierarchy. Correct, in correct, the in the status hierarchy. hierarchy. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so that seems to be one of the sort of psychological maneuvers by which you see these somewhat ironic effects where you, the, the very same folks you would, see, you would predict would not want to support these policies do for this reason. And I would just add to that, to, to the piece about history, is that um, Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, a great uh, philosopher, historian, intellectual activist, uh, to called it the wages of whiteness and with respect to race and how race maintains and racial ideology maintains that separation because the, the, the last place in America for much of American history, certainly in the 18th and 19th and much of the 20th century, were, were black people, right? But for a whole host of reasons, which we all know historically. And the, the wage of whiteness has a value that kept the lowest white above the highest black. And Du Bois also wrote, actually in Reconstruction, in Black Reconstruction in 1935, he talked about the, the splendid failure of Reconstruction, said that one of the failures of Reconstruction was the inability, because of that racial dynamic, the value of the wage of whiteness, the inability of white working people and black working people in the wake of emancipation to come together to create a new kind of economic and social alliance, and that the ways in which the former planters and yet still elites in the aftermath of the abolition of slavery, though certainly diminished by the abolition of slavery, which was their bread and butter, literally, um, still had power in society to pit blacks and whites and the lowering classes against one another. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about this particular moment in Trump is that, I mean, think about this guy, right? He descends from a penthouse on a gold escalator in a gold building with his name on the front surrounded by supermodels to be the savior of the working people of America, <laughs> right? I mean, this is absurd on its face, literally, or its facade. Uh, it's absurd on its facade. And yet, at the same time, he has overwhelming support from people who have two-year rather than four-year college degrees, and from small business people who are burdened by the by the the costs of Obamacare, so they think, and by an economic recession that was not caused by Barack Obama, but that was blamed on Barack Obama. And so what Trump has is a whole bunch of folks who aspire to a kind of American dream, which has always been a fiction that they still think is alive in the figure of Trump. He's the American dream supersize. He's what these folks want to be, particularly these white men want to be. And by ginning up the kind of Islamophobia and the racism and the sort of marking of, of, of racialized others, 
right, and, and ethnicized and, and, and uh, you know, Muslims and Mexicans and blacks and so forth, by ginning up that racial hatred, he's able to keep alive the same kinds of interracial economic competition that's always been part of American culture. At the same time, he keeps alive this sort of belief that someday they too might be just like him. And so he's, he's aspirational. He's an aspirational figure for a certain segment of the population who have genuine economic grievances because they too live within the context of that economic inequality, and yet it comes to us packaged in the form of racism and xenophobia and Islamophobia, which is the ugliest part of America. And so it's what I think that the task is to, to, to try, in some way, to decouple these things. Can we deal with the legit grievances over the economy and over inequality and over alienation socioeconomically, and, but detangle it, defang it from the insidiousness of the racism and xenophobia and Islamophobia that it often comes packaged as. But Trump's been a genius in keeping those things yoked together, and the great demagogues of American history have always been very, very good at that. Can I ask a short follow-up question? Sure. Um, I don't want to subtract from the questions from the audience. One view is that this was meant to be, that the rise of Trump was mm. perfect storm, that there's lots of ingredients. That mm -hmm. The other way to look at it, it could have been otherwise, that sort of engage in what social psychologists call counterfactual. So mm. I guess I'm sort of on board with this. It's, it was really meant to be. But on the other hand, you know, Jeb Bush in a different universe, um, I mean, if things had not gone wrong at various, I, I could have seen him as being the viable candidate. So I guess one sure. part of my brain says, yes, it's inevitable. You so low energy. <laughs> well, <laughs> but no, I mean, no, was no, this, was this? <laughs> think about yeah. it like this, the yeah. way I would put this, you're, you're exactly right on point. And yeah. the problem is there's no Donald Trump on the left. That's right, that's right. Because I would have predicted Hillary would have gone the same way as Jeb if there had been such a thing. That's right, and Bernie Unfortunately, Sanders Unfortunately, her challenger, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, yeah. was an unknown 74-year-old socialist from Vermont. Vermont, right. <laughs> uh, and who almost yeah. pulled it off despite that. Who almost did, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Let's get one or two more questions. Uh, yeah, yep. right here. We, ha mm -hmm. we have the final question right in the back here. Oh, we do. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Sorry. Well, you should oh. give him a chance to do that. Yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. two questions. Hi. Um, to the degree that nature favors diversity, is that any cause for at least some long-term evolutionary <laughs> hope that we can transcend the other mm. and us divide? I'm glad you brought us back to that because I was going to, I'm not going to have time to ask my question about hope. Like how do we get through the kind of pessimism, the doom and gloom to a place of hope that's realistic. But yeah, and uh, we're not. I don't know about transcend, but yeah. there, there's one line of thought which suggests, as much as this might bother some people, that uh, society works best when there are a collection of individuals who are threat sensitive and those who aren't, yeah. um, liberals and conservatives, yeah. that we need each other. That, um, you know, it, it is a dangerous world. Um, but and there's a name, you know, that biologists have for organisms that are not sensitive to threats in their environment, and that name is dead. <laughs> so, um, you know, obviously there's a risk. But there's a risk on the other side too. You know, if you're so focused on these threats that you're not engaging in trade, you're not uh, listening to other people's ideas, yeah. you know, you're, you're gonna be a dead society anyway. So, you know, it's possible that we actually need the, mm. the diversity that, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else wanna add to that? No, no. 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 good, okay. Yeah, let's, let's finish here, right well, here. I think Larry made a great point in his excellent talk about the, um, the fact that during the 70s, I think you said, when the economy was really booming, uh, we had a rising tide lifting all boats, including minorities, including blacks, and we've lost that. So my question is, uh, is one of the reasons we've had a degradation of uh, rights for black citizens between the mid-90s and now, the result of the fact that we've had virtually no economic growth in this country? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. It, when the pie is expanding, People can be more generous about a, a great many things, especially if it's expanding in a way that's generally reducing inequality at the same time. That, that post-World War era, which many economists refer to, post-World War II era, which many economists refer to as you know, the, the golden age, was astonishing in terms of kind of record economic growth and actual income gains for people near the lower end of the income distribution. The, the gap's got narrower. 
And post-73, you know, a variety of things happen. Uh, OPEC emerges, you, you get the, the, the energy crisis shock, you then followed by, by Reaganomics and a variety of other changes uh, in, in the economy, uh, and then the introduction of, of computerization and de-skilling of all kind of work, the collapse of union. Many, many changes feed into creating a context uh, um, in which people in the middle and especially lower reaches of the economy or low skilled people just don't have the future prospects that existed 40, 50 years ago. And deciding in that context that, well, we need to redistribute downward, you know, it's, it, that's a, a harder negotiating point <laughs> in, in that kind of context. Era was, to a great extent, due to a lot of conflict. Right. Us, us and the Russians, and the the, the economy growing, mm. and all the benefits mm -hmm. that we all had came from the Cold War conflict. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we haven't. Uh, well, it, it it helps. You know, my my pessimistic view of it. Um, great changes in race relations, big upsets to the racial hierarchy, yeah. have normally required an enormous external threat. Right. Uh, a different something them. war. Oh, yeah, it required war. Well, it yeah. has literally required, and not only war, it's also required uh, the really need to mobilize large numbers of minorities, as is often forgotten in how we tell the story George Washington had to do That's right. uh, in the Revolutionary War, and that mobilization is effectively what ended slavery above the Mason-Dixon line mm -hmm. uh, in that era. Then you get the Civil War, and essentially the South was a totally functioning, profitable economic social order mm -hmm. that was crushed by an industrializing North. It was an right. external force totally. that said, we're not going to have that competing with us anymore. We're going to destroy it. Right. And they did. <laughs> All right? Yeah. And then we're fighting communism. And so literally, uh, what does Russia do in the worldwide struggle to delegitimate the US? Right. You just show films of lynchings, films of civil rights protesters uh, being beaten. This is the leader of the free world. And so the Department of Justice literally submits an amicus brief in the Brown versus Board of Education decision declaring on behalf of the US government that segregation is an embarrassment to us in the worldwide struggle against communism, <laughs> right? Uh, so yeah, absolutely, it's, it's a big piece of the puzzle. And so I'm waiting for Mars to attack. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Independence Day. <laughs> I, no, that, right. That's that's exactly right. I, I want to just briefly mention uh, that that would help. Yeah, actually. exactly. <laughs> I'm going to Mars with the Obamas in January. So and Elon going. Musk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, on on a much more micro level, uh, in complement to all all of these points, it's interesting to note that a colleague of mine, Amy Crush, finds that when people are primed with notions of inequality, and sp specifically economic scarcity, it actually changed their perceptual judgments of skin tone. Mm. So this is manifesting not only at structural levels, but also within individuals moment by moment. So if you make someone feel impoverished by saying, you know, you, you could have $10 of 10 or $10 of 100 could have been the possibility. What you find is that people will say, take the same racially ambiguous person, and when they're put under conditions of economic scarcity, they're more likely to categorize them as black. So they're drawing those boundaries tighter and tighter and tighter as a function of feeling economic. And we thought we've talked about physical threat, economic threat, value threats work the yeah. same way, yeah. right? And so all you need is that threatening component and you see the manifestation of people drawing these boundaries at every level of processing from perceptual judgments to how they interact with one another through institutions. <laughs> it's worth noting, too, that as all these political um, dynamics go in, there's some uh, looming prospect of hostilities between the United States and, and Russia. So mm -hmm. this is a thought experiment. I don't want to see happen, but um, God knows what happened if, if that erupted, what, how that would change the political dynamics in the United States. Um, right, but, right, okay. But. Well, on that note, with Mars on the horizon <laughs> and uh, Justin Trudeau calling all of us in the wake of, uh, the, of November 8th, I just wanted to say what a fascinating conversation it's been and what a wonderful oh, evening. Right. Thank you Amazing. very much. Thank you for coming.
Thank you guys, everybody, for showing up and for staying late. We invite you to join us downstairs for a reception, further conversation, a drink, some light nibbles, um, and we hope that we can continue to try to solve the problems of the world. <laughs> yes. yes great. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. <laughs>